Good day, friends, and welcome to Jesus in the Center, One Year Bible Podcast. Michael Dobler here with Reiko Zek. Week before Thanksgiving, and we give thanks that we get to spend more time in Ezekiel and James today. Readings for November 20th, 2024. We uh, have to reach back again in Ezekiel to pick it up in chapter 40. Reading for yesterday begins with a new time stamp, which in Ezekiel we know is... uh, Sign that something important is happening in the 25th year of our exile at the beginning of the year on the 10th of the month in the 14th year after the fall of the city. On that very day, the hand of the Lord was on me, and he took me there. In visions of God, he took me to the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain on whose south side were some buildings that looked like a city. Can I pause you, Michael? Yeah. So the last time stamp, if I'm right, it was in Ezekiel 33, and that was the 12th year. So this is 13 years later. Mm-hmm. He's been faithfully prophesying or, or you know, encouraging people to remain steadfast. He's got plenty of other things to tell them, right? 30, yeah. 39 chapters worth. Uh, and then, so anyway, just wanted to mention that. Yeah, and if the 70 years that Jeremiah pre- predicted for the exile, if they began like in 609, something like that, like the first, the very first uh, beginning of the exile, then this would be about halfway through. Okay. So that's one way of thinking about it. Um, okay. Then so this is the 25th year of his exile, which was not the very first. 597, yeah, yeah. I think is when they did that. So this would be 97 minus 25, 70, 68, something like that. Something, something like that. Something like that, yeah. Um, he took me there, and he's, he's brought up on a high mountain. Remember Isaiah 2, that uh, this is more... Uh, eschatological, last things oriented language of the, all the nations streaming up there. Mm-hmm. Um, Jerusalem is, you know, elevated, but it's not what you'd call the highest of mountains. And this, is, so anytime that it's elevated as this super high mountain, then you know that uh, God is looking to the day when He's going to restore all things. And He took me there, and He saw a, a man whose appearance was like bronze. He was standing in the gateway with a linen cord and a measuring rod in his hand. Now, measuring rod is going to if you read this, you know <laughs> it's going to become very important because yeah. there's lots of things to measure. <laughs> there sure is. <laughs> the man said to me, Son of man, look carefully and listen closely and pay attention to everything I'm going to show you, for that is why you have been brought here. Tell the people of Israel everything you see. So, very curious opening to this, very ex- kind of formal prologue to what um, is going to be a description of a new temple. And so that's uh, the chapters for today are about this new temple and the dimensions of it mostly. Um, and this goes for like the next six chapters, right? Yeah. 40 to 45. Yeah, it's broken like up that. a little bit. Yeah. And yeah. The, the purpose of it is always important to keep in mind that this is going to be a temple for God's glory that you remember exited mm-hmm. the temple, you know, hung out on the Mount of Olives and then departed. can't remember. You remember that chapter? Is it seven or eight? Okay. Um, yeah. And then also remember the last time we were in the temple in Ezekiel, it was not good. It was all sorts of activity. All sorts of activity was happening, but it was none of it very good activity. Mm-hmm. There were people who were worshiping all these I- idols, and it was like horror after even horror. The, even the leaders were leading Abominations, yeah. yeah, were filling the temple. And so what we get in, uh, in these chapters, 40 to 48, is like pretty much the exact opposite of that. There's no activity going on, and almost all of the description is just architectural. Mm-hmm. You know, And it, it, it becomes... Uh, people have tried to, you can look up like diagrams of this, um, images of it, but it's very hard to picture actually. Yeah, and if you put, you know, one dude's uh, drawings next to another, it they'd be like, hmm, you know, yeah. a lot of his conjecture, because it's hard to, it's not that Ezekiel's, the bronze, the, the guy in bronze is being unclear. It's just like, well, what does this mean and how does this connect to the other thing? And Right, and it's also, so he's going to give them these very, very, you know, detailed plans or description of what the temple looks like, but he doesn't tell them to build it. He doesn't tell them to, mm-hmm. you know, he just says, this is for you to look carefully, listen closely, pay attention, and then tell the people of everything you see. Yeah. Right. So this is like a vision of the temple that God gives to Ezekiel that, uh, never gets built. Right. I mean, it has never been built. Mm-hmm. Even when the temple was rebuilt, um, you remember in Ezra and Nehemiah, they weep because mm-hmm. they, it's so paltry compared to the Solomon's temple. Yeah, and so I guess the question is, what is what is this? Is this the um, a picture of God's people as we see, you know, we're built into a holy holy temple, you know, First Peter, uh, we're, or is it the uh, heavenly 
temple that will be brought down, you know, that God dwells in with new heavens and new earth. Yeah, well, that's also interesting. So this is not, you'll notice it doesn't have the same dimensions. It doesn't, mm-hmm. it's not the same as Solomon's temple mm-hmm. that, would, that they were given plans for, and God said, go build this, yeah. you know. Um, and then this is interesting. Horace Hummel has a very helpful uh, comparison of this temple versus what we get in Revelation. Because okay. you say, okay, how much of this is... Which is a cube, right? That's in Revelation. Yeah. It's, well, yeah. There's all these, so these are the, the details that are the same as in Revelation. The prophet, or the, you know, the seer, John, is, is transported to a high mountain. Jerusalem is at the center of a new world. God's dwelling is in the midst of his people, and his glory is present in the city. An angelic being uses a measuring rod to measure the city. That comes up in Revelation too. Jerusalem is four square with 12 gates, one for each tribe. That's the same. The geographical order in which the gates are presented is the same. There is an emphasis on purity and holiness for its inhabitants, and the river of life proceeds from God. So those are all the similarities. Here are the differences. All right, well, I just want to camp on that and say, wow, that's, that's like, it's the same. Yeah. It sounds like the same thing. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Besides the dimensions of length and width, height dimensions are given as well, resulting in a city that is not only square but cubical mm-hmm. in Revelation. That's what you're mm-hmm. talking about. The city is built not of ordinary stones but of precious stones and metals, you know, things that you probably couldn't procure that much of mm-hmm. on earth. The holy city is un- unhesitatingly called the New Jerusalem instead of Yahweh is there. Mm. So, right, that, that's the big, um, the whole reason that for this description is that the, the temple is going to be remade and purified mm-hmm. such that God can be there. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's the point of Ezekiel's preaching here. In, um, in Revelation, it's the holy city is called the New Jerusalem instead of Yahweh is there. Mm-hmm. But it does say... God is in the midst of her. Mm-hmm. Instead of the temple at the center of everything, the Apostle John is shown, and this is the biggest one, there is no temple structure, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that would be the biggest difference yeah. uh, in Revelation and this. There are also, the, another big difference, no sacrifices. Mm-hmm. And here you're, you're going to get sea tables for uh, preparing the sacrifices mm-hmm. on the altar because the sacrifice in risen Lamb, the antitype of all the Old Testament sacrifices, lives among his redeemed people. There's no longer any need, this is another big one, to distinguish the holy from the profane or the clean from the unclean because all the people and things in the city are holy already. And this is, is it Zechariah? Where the, the bells on horses are all going yeah, be, to be inscribed holy. holy, holy you know, the yeah. same thing that was on the priest's headband is going to be on the horse's mm-hmm. collar, you know, because everything will be holy. The same vessels that you use for food in your house are going to be just as equal as the vessels mm-hmm. that you use in the temple. It's that kind of vision. And finally, in contrast to Ezekiel's limited vision of Israelites, John sees Christians from all nations coming into the city through its perpetually open gates. Mm. So there are some uh, major differences with Revelation. So can we put them together? That's the question, right? Yeah. It's, it's not a one-to-one. So it's, yeah. you'd think if, if, if the point were that this is exactly what the New Jerusalem is going to be like, which... Mm. Some people who are, who get to really you know in, in fall in love with Gog and Magog you know and mm-hmm. try and find them today you know mm-hmm. s- have similar thoughts about this as being what needs to happen mm-hmm. you know this temple needs yeah. to be built yeah, before the, 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 Christ will come back to the navel of the earth yeah. you know um, yeah confusedly you know uh, Jews would like a new temple because they want to re- they want to have sacrifices those Orthodox Jews or conservative Jews um, and and um, Messianic Christians, some, you know, or dispensationalists would also like, I don't understand it. Even though I was a dispensational, I went to a school that taught dispensational theology. I don't get it. Why we don't need it. We don't need a temple. But reading this, it seems like, even though you said we don't have to build it, it never said that we have to build it. It's just a vision of what, what is uh, yeah. or will be. So it's, it's curious in yeah. any case, the, uh, the dimensions. So you start reading and you're like, okay, this is getting repetitive and mm-hmm. very just like a list of deta- like architectural details. Yeah. So these details have all been combed over. There was a famous uh, Jewish tradition of mysticism that was all about like reflection, you know, mm-hmm. reflecting on numbers and different Is that proportions. Kabbalah or or the there there's a also called the well I think that's part of it. And then the Markiva is that the word for chariot? You know the vision at the beginning of, Jer- of about the chariot. Mm. There was like this Mer- Merkiva mysticism. It's about like speculation about the body of God. Like it gets kind of out yeah. there, you know, because okay. like this is if this is like a revelation of um, the heavenly temple mm-hmm. or something like that, then they like they've just focused on these details and say yeah. the, the mystery of everything must be hidden somewhere in these mm-hmm. 
in these details. But that's not exactly what we find. The uh, description, a couple things to point out. Um, so he shows them like one gate after another in the doorways, and the decorations are all of palm trees. And what verse are you on here, Michael? Well, okay. So Just, the, it's okay, sorry. You know, the uh, south gate. Are we starting in 40? Okay. We are in uh, 40 and 41, yeah. Yeah. So I, I was looking at the readings for today, so oh, starting yeah. at the 40, south. 40, 28, yeah. But we, we should probably go back. Um, so he st- starts showing one, one gate after another, and the, uh, a cubit, this is also very confusing to me, it's always mm-hmm. been confusing. There's like a short cubit and a yeah, long cubit exactly. that were both used, and so it's unclear. One, the long cubit is probably the royal cubit, so it's probably the one that's measured. And in both cases, though, it's like the difference between like a foot and a half and a foot and two thirds or something. Yeah, I don't like know that. why that's confusing. I mean, uh, or a cubit and a, and a hand breadth. I mean, come on, it makes total <laughs> sense to me. Yeah. So, you, so this is also one of the reasons why you get such different drawings is because mm-hmm. what's a cubit? <laughs> you yeah, know? Exactly. There's, there's, uh, there different different kinds of. Use. I mean, in Deuteronomy three, I think it said. You know, something like. So, are we just making a case to say, "Wow, this is just confusing. We don't understand it," <laughs> uh, or is there more to it here that we can take away? No. the The overall point is the point that the glory is going to come back, mm-hmm. and the contrast is probably the most striking thing between this and the temple, as he was given to see it, full of abominations. The temple that uh, maybe what um, I don't know, fifteen years before this was destroyed. Right. Mm-hmm. This was. Uh, destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar's army. Yeah. The, the temple in Jerusalem is gone. Yeah. Right. Okay. And so he's given a vision. Yeah. Yeah. Of of a temple. You know. So, mm-hmm. the, and that's why maybe the the timing of it. You know, mm-hmm. occurring kind of in the middle of exile, not quite halfway, but um, yeah. in the middle of that is like it's a vision of hope. Yeah. You know. I mean, exactly. that, that's that's how it's functioning. Yeah. Here. And we'll it's see like, that is at uh, Habakkuk. No, it's not Habakkuk. Um, well, one of the prophets, I forget, um, has, you know, a lot of sermons about let's rebuild the temple. Um, you know, don't don't pour money into your own houses, but pour it into uh, also into God's work. So, yeah. Um, and so I was just going to mention the decorations is one of the things that you can kind of grasp onto. And that's the palm trees mm-hmm. and the you know fruit um, that this is. Wait, wait, wait. I thought God was against all kind of graven images. Hey, guy. Well, hey, guy was the prophet I was thinking of. Yes. Hey, guy. Um, well, okay, anyway, he also made cherubim, you know, he yeah, commanded, I know. you know, I, so that the I'm cherubim, spe- tongue in cheek, the, uh, the major distinguisher that, I mean, should never be forgotten is that at the center of it, there was no idol, you mm-hmm. know, there was no image of God on right. the throne, you know, exactly. so the cherubim were there to frame, mm-hmm. to, to great, to lend even more drama to the fact that there's no, mm-hmm. you know, where there should be something in the center right. si- sitting there, there's yeah. nothing there exactly. you know, that God does not uh, contain by that. But the palm trees here. They probably are pointing back to the Garden mm-hmm. of Eden, right? Yeah. So, like, the, the temple is always important to remember. Like, it's like heaven meets earth, and it points back to the Eden, Edenic days. And it all, obviously, and here maybe most strikingly, points forward to the day where God will mm. fully yeah. dwell Re- among recreate. his people, yeah. right? So, And then also, is this where the cherubim have a face of a, of a human, face of a lion? Yep. yep. That's, they, that's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. What do you make of that? Um. I, I, just the same thing we said about the lion and okay. the, before that it's uh, I, I don't know is there the greatest of beasts I don't know I just yeah. don't find it interesting greatest you know? of beasts um, so he shows them each of the gates he takes them to the inner sanctuary this is chapter this is chapter well there's the inner court yeah that's chapter 40 right yeah and we're getting through chapter 41 today I guess yeah I don't have much more to say actually okay. um so the, the sons of Zadok, the priests, make an appearance here, and we mention them in conversation with the Sadducees and Qumran mm-hmm. and people trying to maintain purity. Um, it's also just very striking, I think, after the the last image of the uh, or the the prophecy about Gog and Magog that they're going their bodies are going to be out there and mm-hmm. God is going to host a feast of um, you know flesh and blood. Yeah. So, and then this is just a pristine. Mm-hmm. Um, temple it's got yeah. three layers of rooms on mm-hmm. the sides so that they're stacked like three floors yeah. high um and then like i said it's square and it's got the holy place and the most holy place and all the yeah, accoutrement I just, that I'm you just I, here i want to i want to uh i want to read this back 
knowing the New Testament and just in the in you know Peter saying that you, we are a living temple mm-hmm. is that is that allowed? Oh sure. Can I do that? Okay. Yeah. I mean, Jesus. <laughs> I don't think even like allows it or disallows it. He says, like, you know, or at least John, on behalf of Jesus, says he was speaking about his body. Right. <laughs> he was talking right. about the destruction of the temple. Right. So uh, all of that is true. It's just trying to in Ezekiel, find these details mm-hmm. and how they exactly correspond. Okay, what would this mean yeah. about the church? Mm-hmm. This is talking about the church. Right. What would it mean about the ascended body of Jesus? You know, yeah. what, what, which, what, you know, which part of his body is the, the you know, the yeah. second table for preferring sacrifices? I think backing up to what you said, like we may not, some of the church fathers, like you said, was it Eusebius or whoever, was it, had nine sermons on... Gregory this, the Great. Yeah. Gregory, the, oh, Gregory the Great, the... Uh, He's by the way he's in in the uh, our LCMS handbook he is um, listed as a saint and um, Gregory the Great slash comma pastor mm-hmm. <laughs> and not pope yeah. uh, and the reformers said he's the last great pope because he was a great he was a great pastor sent missionaries to Angleland by the way England um, to bring the gospel there so yeah, yeah he was he was a great big deal yeah so anyway okay so we had nine sermons on it we have a. Uh, uh, half a po- podcast on it, and we can't mind the depths of it. It's just, it's, um, it's hard to figure out all what it means. But I, I like going back to what you said about, um, you know, this was a word of hope for the exiles. Hang on, uh, God is not finished with you. Um, which, you know, at this time period, this is when some changes happened within Israel. They could not go to the temple, so what did they do? They just kept praying, praying the Psalms all of which were not written yet. So they wrote some psalms, um, and they invented synagogue, right, so that they could pray and hear God's word. They'd probably always been doing that in some some Mm -hmm. regard. But here now in local, every which way, there's a synagogue, uh, which just means, you know, uh, gathering. Um, But this was a word of hope for them. I don't know. I like it. Absolutely. And so that, I mean, I think... All I'm saying, I'm not saying the details are not worth it. I just mm-hmm. don't think you get the same thing out of the details as you get over the overall mm-hmm. place of this description, mm-hmm. like you said, within Ezekiel's prophecy, is that it is. He's given this vision when there is no temple yeah. and to, to give the people hope. And that, that vision uh, is, at least in part, a preview of mm-hmm. what John will see and mm-hmm. what we continue to look forward to. But there are important... It's easy to... It's easy to just mesh them together yeah. into, into one right. temple, and that's that's the thing that you want to resist doing because they're they don't mm-hmm. actually yeah. line up exactly. Right, exactly. Know? So John uses well, that's whole. Both of these prophets are inspired, and so different purposes of these uh, revelations. Um, but I like how um, you know thinking back how what we know about the temple. Uh, in Ezekiel is that it's destroyed. It's uh, the place where God's glory leaves. Um, and it was abandoned because it was, it was a place of sin. The, the people had no faith. And yet uh, God says he's not done with the temple, the holy place. The, um, and yet people are involved here. It's like he's bringing his holiness to people, which, like you said, that, that is what Jesus does. You know, he touches us with his holiness. So, all right, well, with that, how about we, um, since we solved all that, figured it all out, <laughs> <laughs> Let's jump over to James chapter 4. Um, around 18 minutes so far, and we're going to read, I believe we're on the whole chapter, um, 1 to 17. Um, Michael, would you read a little bit here? Why don't you read up to verse 6? What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Mm. Good words here. Uh, I just read with a few folks the other day uh, this the, this spiritual clash between uh, with Elijah and the prophets of Baal, right? They, uh, on the Mount Mount Carmel, First Kings chapter eighteen, and that's sort of this clash: who is God? Um, and we see this clash here: worldliness versus true spirituality. You know, um, but there's a lot to take away here, but. He calls them 
uh, he, he ex- here's this word excoriates them. He he calls them out as adulterous people. You know, he's he's saying you are not living as Christians. So what a uh, what a call uh, of repentance for them. So he also says that you know you don't receive what you ask for because well either you don't ask or if you ask you have the wrong motive. So you know a call for us to um, to repent. I don't know. What, what thoughts do you have here, Michael? There's a lot of things to ponder here. Uh, yeah, just uh, this is also the place to go where when people, I don't think anyone ever says this, but to be like, oh, the devil made me do it or, mm. you know, things like that. You know, he's talking about what produces all this quarrel? It's your own messed up desire. Right, <laughs> you know, exactly. Like, it's your own, you know, ill will. Yeah, he, he says that It's your own frustrated desire. You know, that's, right. a, that's a good way of putting it. You know, you don't, you can't get what you want, so you covet or you kill. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Quarrel and fight about it. Back to chapter one, he says, Each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, ha- when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. He says, There's something wrong with your heart. You know, um, we're tempted by our own lusts and desires. And, and here yeah. they come out with uh, the fruit of that is, is quarreling and fighting. Um, other places, Romans 16, Paul says that to avoid those who cause division, you know, it's not just an accident. It's. It comes from um, our hearts uh, not being right. So yeah, I always just thought this was a very relatable way of mm-hmm. talking about sin. You know and yeah. how, how sin actually works in our minds, mm-hmm. and then you know the same. I this is a different. I just think of Paul in Ephesians. You know, talking about you know while you were enemies of God. Mm. Uh, here he says so you you become an enemy with God when you become friends with the world. Oh yeah, you know, that's that's, good. A, that's a striking yeah difference, and that you can. He's addressing, you know, these uh, believers, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, with the law that you can make yourself, again, an enemy of God. Yeah, you know? well, it's sort of like Hebrews. It's like there's very clear warnings, you know, do not drift away, don't fall away. You know, um, uh, he's speaking to, to believers and calling, because believers can, you know, not all not all Christians believe this, but the, the scriptures seem to teach that, you know, you can— uh, the seed of faith with the, of God's word in you can be stolen, um, you know, in many ways. It can be choked out. It can be uh, burned up, um, you know, because of life is good or life is bad. You know, go back to, to Mark chapter 4 and the parable of the sower. Uh, we can, our, the gift of faith can, don't take it for granted, I think is what uh, mm-hmm. he's saying here. So, yep. And then we get to, um, well, he quotes a proverb, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. You know, how many times does... Jesus say things like this. Uh, James is so close. If you read just the words of Jesus, and then you read James lined up to it, it's like, wow, they're really saying, they're speaking the same language, mm-hmm. you know? And then starting in verse 7, uh, there's 11 commands and three promises. And um, so, Michael, as we read this, I'll ask you to, uh, is there a word or two to summarize these 11 commands? Mm-hmm. So maybe we'll read that. So um, why don't you do that? Why don't you read verses 7 to 10, Michael? Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Hmm. A lot to ponder there. How could we summarize that? What is he... What does he want us to do? I mean, it's very clear, right? All these things are just layers upon layers of the same thing. Yeah. It's kind of, yeah, a good description of repentance, I would say. Yeah, that's exactly what I wrote down. So, um, all right, great minds think alike, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, it's like, we. this is definitely a, a call to repentance. I love, though, I love the part, submit yourselves, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This is this is remarkable. This is, the the devil is so powerful. He's more powerful than any human on earth by far, like no comparison. And yet it says here, as we submit to God, that this devil, this, this hater of souls, this powerful spiritual being, he has to flee from us. Like, that's awesome. That is so great. Um, yeah. What do you think? Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Is that the second promise? Uh, yeah. That, um, yeah, that's the second promise. So yeah, what are the three promises? Yeah, the devil will flee from you. What else? God will, will come to you if you come yep. near to him. Yep. And um, he will exalt you. He will you. lift you up. Yeah, yeah that's humble yourself. Exactly. Humble yourself. So uh, 
you know, the, in Jesus, a lot of the Jesus's parables end with something like that. You know, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. He who exalts himself uh, will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. And so what is, what does James mean by this? Is there any, any uh, wise words you got here, Michael? This in the last day, he will save us. He will take us to himself in glory. Uh, I, I, tend to think about it in the same way that uh, Paul talks about boasting, you mm-hmm. know, that uh, a boast is like the ultimate vindication, mm-hmm. you know, like out in the world, you can be judged any number of ways by people mm-hmm. as a success or a failure, as a good person or a bad person, as a fool or as a wise person. Mm-hmm. But the one whose judgment really matters is the one who, before whom, if you humble yourself, yeah. he will lift you up. He'll vindicate you. I like um, it. That's great. Yeah. That's Amen. 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 All right. Well, we got a couple more verses up to verse 17. So I'll read that section. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Um, is, he, is he mostly that last verse, whoever knows the right thing and fails to do it, to him it is sin? Of course, that could apply to anything, but is that applying to um, that we should speak? Um, the, our time is in the Lord's hands. Uh, you know, If the Lord wills, that we should end every sentence with God willing. Yeah, I think I... I learned a version of that when I was, or I heard this as mm. as saying that something like that. Okay. Um, yeah. I don't know. I. I think. Uh, I mean, I th- verse yeah. seventeen. I thought that that's when you were asking about it yeah. in particular. If anyone then knows the good thing they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Mm-hmm. This was a. I remember a big. Revelation to me. Uh, when I was taught the difference between sins of commission and sins mm-hmm. of omission. Right. That, like, if you think, oh, you know, being a Christian is not that hard, and, like, you know, uh, sin is pretty easy to avoid. Yeah, just, just don't like, do these Remember ten these things. ten things, yeah. yeah. But then thinking about all of the good that you should do that right. you end up not doing, yeah. that, that all of that is sin. Uh, yeah, just take one commandment. Just, omission. Uh, you know. Take your pick. Um, shall not steal, right? It's really not about just not stealing. Okay, I kept it. I kept the commandment. I pleased God. No, it's like... I need to live generously. I need to look out for my neighbor's needs. How how can I always think about what they need uh, and then um, sacrifice my own desires, priorities to, to provide for them, right? I mean, it's like when you put it in that light, it's like, yeah, I have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, and things I've done and things I've left undone, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. There's, I mean, an endless inventory of things yeah. that you know you should do that, you haven't done absolutely and so james is saying um yeah come on christians be like be uh, live live as a christian <laughs> yeah but i like to just i think it's important a lot of people do say you know if the lord wills and, and yep. that is good this is where this comes from yep uh god willing and um and jesus know. prayer in the garden yeah if it be your will yeah you know uh, right. but that may be where james gets it exactly <laughs> probably where james gets it exactly so yeah so god willing uh dear listener we will um we will See you tomorrow because we're going to close out now. So go in peace. Serve the Lord. (laughs) Thanks be to God.